Promotional considerations provided by Polaroid. Polaroid has just released a sequel to the smallest instant camera ever made. The Polaroid Go Generation 2 camera is here. And in this episode of In an Instant, we are traveling on the road in Texas to show you how I use the Go on the go. And we're gonna talk about the variety of improvements that have been made to the Generation 2 of this camera. We're gonna talk about tips and tricks of how to maximize the potential of the Go. And while it might be true that everything is bigger in Texas, sometimes great things come in small packages. Let's do it. A kind of photography that would become part of the human being. Press a button and have the picture. Howdy, partner. Welcome to In An Instant. My name is Ben. And today we're gonna take another close look at the Polaroid Go. And it requires a close look because man, this thing is smaller than a ruby red grapefruit, but takes pictures more than twice as good. Polaroid has rolled out the second generation of the Polaroid Go camera. And while we're gonna get this Go on the road in a moment, let me re-familiarize you with this jarringly cute object. Polaroid Go debuted three years ago in 2021 as the smallest format of instant film. And it was quite a swing by Polaroid. It was their first new format in over two decades. A more playful camera and film system than the classic Polaroid frames. With the sands of time pushing us ever forward on an unstoppable linear track, the Go needed a tune-up, a couple tweaks to the camera to make getting a proper exposure easier. And that's where the Go Gen 2 comes in, the first ever update to Go hardware. I've spent three years burning through baby frames with the baby doinker, from snapping a shot of anyone and everyone to more artistic compositions, and I have learned a lot about how to take photos that I like with this system, which I prefer to photos that I don't like. This is a camera meant for everyone, all skill ranges, but certainly benefits from using proper technique and thinking about how to take an effective shot on such a small canvas. In this episode, we're breaking down how to get the most out of this crazy little film as we hit the old dusty trail, where we're talking tips and tricks in Texas on one of my many explorations of this very strange country I live in. Lots of weird stuff going on here. The first stop on our journey is Denton, also known as the Little D, where the beaming Texas sun has us wondering when and how we should be using flash on the go. And we're joined by a gaggle of goons from Denton's thriving art community. We have to discuss flash. When it comes to the Polaroid Go, it's one of the most essential features because the flash is always on. When you turn the camera on, the flash is automatically toggled. After you take a photo, the flash charges up again. If you like to use flash off, you have to manually disable it every time you take a shot. But the Go is really sort of calibrated to give you the most even exposure when the flash is toggled on. You might think, why use flash outdoors at all? Isn't it really bright? Isn't flash gonna have absolutely no effect on your photo? It's true, in many cases it won't. Flash power diminishes substantially the further away you get from your subject. So using flash outdoors isn't gonna have much of an impact when you're pretty far away from something. Um, that's why you can kind of just leave the flash on a lot of the time when you're outside, especially if you're taking a photo of a sign or a building. Flash is never gonna impact that. Maybe left hand? <laughs> Three, two, one. So now we've, we've encountered the perfect scenario where fill flash comes into play in a big way. So Andy is very backlit here. The sun is behind us. He's wonderfully haloed. It might be a good shot to turn the flash off. That might look kind of nice and give him a nice key light from behind and a glow. But this is also an interesting time to use flash. The exposure is so bright behind Andy, he could end up sort of silhouetted by this, especially due to the automatic exposure of the camera. There's no way to use exposure compensation on the go to adjust for that. So flash will fill him in here and probably give him a nice look. Let's, let's give it a shot. Now let's talk about taking portraits on the Polaroid Go. This is the world's smallest instant film format. And so if your subject is really small in frame, they're gonna be teeny tiny. Something you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind is having your subject actually closer to you might be more impactful as a portrait. Here we have Andy, who's at elevation by a historic purple door. Andy can't come closer to us because he's up by that door, but we're gonna take a couple photos anyway, one further back and one closer up. And let's see which one we like more. This might be a situation where the wide shot actually is better, but <laughs> three, two, one, and maybe give me like a point. Yup. So the Polaroid Go is a fixed focus camera. Whereas a camera like the SX-70 or the Polaroid i2 or the Polaroid Now Plus have multiple zones of focus. So with the Go being fixed focus, 
A very important principle to understand is minimum focusing distance. This is the closest you can get to someone with the fixed lens still maintaining focus before things start getting soft. My rule of thumb is actually a rule of my arm, which is the arm is about the minimum focusing distance of the go. So typically when I'm lining up a picture, why don't we shift you over a little bit here? I kind of do this and I'm like, that's approximately the minimum distance. Lovely. So it's a good rule of thumb slash arm to use. That way you can get your subject as large as you can in frame on this tiny little format. Now that we dialed in our technique for portraiture, it was time to hop back on the road with my wife Lauren and head south, where we took as circuitous a route as possible down the roads less traveled. This is when I most often have the go on me as I bop around the country and take a little slice of documentation wherever I go, even if it's just a flyer to come back for more someday. We next stopped in Hood County, Texas, population 430, where we found a chair big enough for Yo Mama. One of my favorite things about driving through this wonderfully weird country of ours is seeing the bizarre landmarks that small towns have made their claims to fame. Something to attract visitors to come through. Something like this. Yeah, the largest cedar rocking chair in the world. Now, this used to be the largest rocking chair of any kind in the world, but unfortunately, someone somewhere, some why decided to make a larger rocking chair. So now it's the largest cedar rocking chair in the world. We have to respect it. We got some pretty severe backlighting on this chair. We're not gonna have a lot of chances to shoot it, obviously. So I just took a very silhouetted front-facing version. This is a harsh reality of being on the road. You end up in situations where you don't have much of a choice. You either decide not to take the photo or you take the picture just to have a record of what you saw. Uh, sometimes the lighting's not gonna be perfect. I would have preferred, obviously, the light to be front-facing on this chair, <laughs> but instead it's behind it. Um, but that's what the Polaroid Go is great for, just taking a little record of something and then moving on. Bounding further south, we timed our days to best suit the conditions for good neon photography. These trips to the south, southwest, and west-west are filled with unique relics from the 1950s and 60s, but none draw me closer than the sweet buzz of neon. We hit Waco, Texas a few minutes prior to sunset, doing some housekeeping on signs and buildings with less prominent neon first, including a remarkably well-preserved Gulf station. This time of day is when I find the go is most consistent with its exposures. That's because when it comes to shooting something like neon, the exposure of the sky is finally pretty similar to the exposure of the neon light glowing on the sign. Whereas if this was shot midday, you would hardly see the neon at all. And whether you're shooting people or buildings, the open shade and eventual blue hour that's created by a low sun is just the right sweet spot for the best go pictures. Go or no go, the fast track to better images is better lighting. And the narrower dynamic range of instant film makes this doubly true. Possibly, possibly triply true. The next day we hit our final destination, Austin, Texas, a true neon capital of the world. And we had to bring the go to the beating heart of Austin's neon buzz, Roadside Relics, where artist Todd Sanders designs and crafts some of the most remarkable beauties of the form. Todd, it's a pleasure, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to have you, thank you. Amazing stop on this journey of ours through Texas. I mean, we have just seen an unbelievable volume of neon. So what's the, what's the deal with Austin and neon? I um, fell in love with Austin partially because of the neon, but I created the first neon company that was dedicated to making vintage neon for new businesses. I stopped that in 2005 and, and turned it into fine art, but our first date, my wife and I, I drove around and showed her. It was like driving through my portfolio. <laughs> That's awesome. And it, there's maybe four old original signs that I made around town, but um, at one time there were 50. Another reason why I started making fine art, because I was you know, realizing I was 10 years after I'm gone, there'd be no trace of me. You know? I mean, that's part of what motivates me to photograph neon is that how common it is for neon to just disappear. One yeah. day it's here, one day it's not. Yeah. And so preservation is a huge part of why I'm documenting it. So the fact that you're sort of creating it anew is so interesting. Neon itself has this uh, primal thing that it connects with people. It's taken from the atmosphere and like the aurora borealis is neon, gases ignited in the atmosphere. And so there's nothing that's ever gonna fully replace it. 
that's part partially I think why I love documenting it on film because you're it's like chemi chemistry and chemistry yep. especially on Polaroid where you're just sort of like seeing it come to life and you're sort of capturing a bit of its spirit sort of in every frame. Yeah, it's like a modern campfire, you know, mixed with a full moon. It, it, it's something that, you know, really affects, it, it affects me, yeah, in, me too. A, in a basic way, yeah. you know. And so, Neon will endure. As we wrapped our taste of Texas, I got to reflect on what the Generation 2 version of the Go camera really brought to the table. So, let's talk about what's new in Gen 2. While the new model only visually defers in that it has the updated logo and a upgraded USB-C port, plus the butaceous blue colorway, there are some improvements under the hood. Not to breeze past USB-C, don't tell USB-A, but it kinda sucks through a paper straw in comparison to USB-C. Beyond that buff grade, Gen 2 has a new lens. Uh, the first model had an aperture range of f12 to f52, while Gen 2 has a range of f9 to f45. That means the new Go can shoot at the wider aperture of F9, increasing the amount of light that can enter the camera and thus making it better in dimmer lighting environments. This upgrade is paired with a refinement of the light sensor, which enables better auto exposure with the camera. As we discussed while shooting portraits with backlighting, the Go doesn't have exposure compensation. It is fully automatic. And so the ability for that sensor to give you more hits than misses is arguably the most important element of the camera. I found that these improvements make a huge difference in the resulting pictures. It's actually quite wild in Waco what you can accomplish indoors without flash, given that wider aperture. The low light performance is extremely consistent. Camera shake is also less apparent on a film this small, so you can take higher risks in lower light using the camera with flash toggled off in situations that might typically result in too slow of a shutter speed to make a sharp image. You can't really tell on the go. I also do think the lens is sharper, or at least images seem overall more clear to me. I know sharpness might be a ridiculous factor to consider on a film the size of an Oreo, but being able to resolve a scene with more clarity does make a big difference on a small format. It's the difference between squinting to see what you shot and saying, oh wow, I love this image and can distinguish its contents with relative ease. Like the first Go, there are some additional features on board. If it's not clear, you can disable the flash by hitting the button with the lightning bolt on it. There's also double exposure mode, which you can achieve by double pressing the flash button. Then there's self timer, started by long pressing the flash button for two seconds, which toggles a 10 second countdown until exposure. On the topic of self portraiture, there is a selfie mirror coded onto the viewfinder. It's also fun because subjects of portraits can see themselves in the mirror. Sometimes that just adds to the whimsy of the human photo taking experience. There's also a built-in film shield, which is essential to leave over your frame for the first few seconds after exposure. I've seen numerous people lament having torn it off. You just have to flip it and it rolls back. Don't tear it off. That is violence against the go and it is not tolerated around here. There are three things guaranteed in life. Death, taxes, and the Polaroid Go being so darn cute. It's been lovely to tote this little angel around for three years and many more journeys to come. I'd like to thank Polaroid for collaborating on this video. They simply prompted me with the question, how do you use the Go? And this is how I go. And I hope it helps you go too. Thank you for watching In An Instant. Go Gen 2 and boop that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more journeys on the road, reviews, breakdowns, and all things instant. Bye.